Welcome everyone to the session on the, the IEEE uh, Computer Society DVP SYP uh, virtual conference on hot topics in cybersecurity. The Student and Young Professionals Activities Committee was developed uh, to support the Computer Society's student and young professionals globally through initiatives targeted at advancing their knowledge, development, and careers. The Distinguished Visitors Program was initiated in 1971 by Dr. Stephen Yao and offers top quality speakers to professional and student chapters. Um, I would like to introduce um, our co-chairs. Um, Nate Toth is one. He's a cybersecurity uh, specialist, as is, and I think we need to, uh, let me find my slides here. Um, sorry, uh, Jan Belubic, Belubic um, is uh, part of the uh, Czechoslovakia section chair. Uh, he is um, also a, a specialist in the area. Sudarshan uh, R is the Madras section YP XCOM member. Nate Toth is the Madison section chair. Our advisory panel. Um, consists of George Proler, who's the Distinguished Visitors Program Chair, Mega Ben, who is the uh, Chair of the Computer Society Student and Young Professionals Activities Committee, and Shivam, who's the Vice Chair for Collaborations. I, myself, am Carrie Cosby. I'm the Chapters Manager here at the IEEE Computer Society. Before we go any farther, I'd like to uh, get a couple of housekeeping tasks out of the way. Uh, you can ask your questions in the Q&A panel. Dr. Zanero will answer as many questions as he can following the presentation. Um, the session is going to be recorded and slides and recording will be made available after the session. We have currently uh, most of our registrants from the United States and from India. You can see a lot of the uh, information about the registrations here. This slide gives you a little bit of information about the activities today. Right now is our keynote speech, again, by De Stefano Zanero on Crouching Hacker killer robot, removing fear from cyber physical security. And then we'll also have a graduate program in cybersecurity session at 2 o'clock today, uh, 6 p.m. UTC. Tomorrow we are planning on having uh, an, a sessions on uh, security of cyber physical systems at 6 a.m. Eastern time, 10 o'clock in the morning UTC. And at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 2 o'clock p.m. UTC, we'll have advancements in information security algorithms. At 2 p.m. Eastern Time uh, and 6 p.m. UTC, we'll have dealing with cyber attack. At 6 p.m. Eastern Time and 10 p.m. Uh, UTC, we'll have access control in a touchless society. All of those should be a great um, topics or presentations, and I, we highly recommend that you come to them. Let me introduce first our president, um, she, Dr. Leila uh, De Floriani. She's a professor at the University of Maryland College Park, USA. She has previously been a professor at the University of Genova, Italy, and she's held positions at the University of Nebraska, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and the Italian National Research Council. Dr. De Floriani, welcome, and we greatly appreciate your saying a few words. Dr. De Floriani, are you with us? I 
think we may have lost her for the moment. Um, perhaps we will just move on until we can get her back. Um, so our keynote speaker today is Stefano Zanero. And let me now introduce uh, Stefano Zanero. Um, he, Dr. Zanero received a PhD in computer engineering from Politecnico de Milano, uh, which is currently, he's currently an associate professor there in the Department of, uh, Departamento de Electronico Información y Bioingenieria. Um, his research focuses on malware analysis, cyber physical cyber physical security, and cyber security in general. He has co-authored over 90 scientific papers and books. He is a senior member of the IEEE and sits in the Board of Governors of the IEEE Computer Society. He is a lifetime senior member of the ACM and has been named a fellow of the ISSA, the Information System Security <laughs> Association. Stefano is a co-founder and chairman of the Secure Network, of Secure Network, a leading security assessment firm, and co-founder of Bank Sealer, a startup um, in the fintech sector at, that addresses fraud detection through machine learning techniques. Today he will be presenting Crouching Hacker, Killer Robot. Uh, removing fear from cybersecurity. I do see that uh, Dr. De Floriani has been able to make it back. I'd like to give her a moment to say a few words, if she would. Oh, thank you very much, and sorry for this problem. I want to uh, welcome everybody here to the IEEE Society event uh, with, uh, done jointly by DVP and the Student and Young Professional Conference on a hot topic in cybersecurity. So I believe actually that this is the first time that we have uh, two standing committee inside MGA collaborating to put up an event, and it looks like they have done uh, really an excellent job. Let me start thanking our co-chair for this conference, Nathan Tott, Jan Bielorubek, and Sadha Shanhar. All of them have put uh, in a lot of time, a lot of energy into organizing the event. And actually, this is very clear for the quality of the program. I would like also to thank the Distinguished Visitor Program Committee, led by George Proler and George himself. They have assembled a wide variety of speakers from around the world. And not only speakers for this conference, but speakers on many other different topics, from artificial intelligence to e-health, personalized analytics, and actually even more. And this is a great support for our Distinguished Visitor Program. Actually, if you are interested in becoming a Distinguished Speaker, I encourage you very much to nominate yourself. If you know somebody who might be a good uh, fit to serve on this program, please encourage uh, him or her to apply. Now, the deadline for the nomination is at the end of November, November 3rd. Of course, this event would not have been possible without uh, actually the, the fundamental support of uh, our Student and Young Professional Activities Committee, which is chaired by Megaben and by the support of Shivam, the Vice Chair of Collaboration. Our uh, Student and Young Professional Committee has done a really great amount of work doing volunteer to support our efforts to develop initiatives for students and young professionals. And uh, also, very importantly, ensuring that once the students uh, graduate, they continue to see the importance of the society and how the computer society and IEEE can help them in their careers. I actually, I hope you are able to jo join us for more of this section. There are many other interesting sections uh, with graduate program cybersecurity, cyber physical security, advancement of algorithms for cybersecurity, dealing with the cyber attack and access control in the society. So very, very interesting topic. All of them, they actually 
I promise to be as informative as to the keynote talk by Dr. Stefano Zanero. I also would like to, to thank Stefano for accepting this invitation, and uh, I very much look forward to listening to his presentation. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Dr. De Floriani, uh, for that one, those wonderful words. Um, before I move over to um, Dr. Stefano, I'd like to remind everyone that this will be this conference will be recorded, and we will be emailing the recording to you along with the slides. Uh, Dr. Uh, Zanero, you are welcome to begin. I'm handing off the floor to you. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thanks, uh, Leila. Uh, I appreciate uh, your welcome message uh, and uh, uh, the uh, enormous amount of work that you have done for the society in this year of presidency. Uh, I've been able to witness it firsthand. Um, and um, thanks to all uh, the people that have joined us online today for this uh, uh, conference. Uh, what I would like to, to talk about is uh, in part a uh, technical subject, and in part, as you will see, uh, it deals with the implications of our research and of our conferences. Um, they are musings that have been uh, uh, accumulating with me for a long time. And I hope that uh, there is some insight in there that you can find useful. So um, I would like to start from the, um, from the observation that uh, uh, cybersecurity is uh, actually a circus. And uh, in uh, all circuses all over the world, uh, you join this, you, 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 you go to the circus to to, to see the attractions, right? It, it, you go there to see uh, people performing stunts. And who are the attractions? Who are the people performing stunts in the cybersecurity world? Well, you know, uh, there's no tigers and there's no uh, acrobats, but there's, there's people like us, there's uh, um, researchers, there's hackers, and there's uh, people performing public stunts. Um, the person in the slide is uh, uh, Barnaby Jack. Barnes uh, was uh, uh, Barnes who unfortunately prematurely uh, left us a, a few years ago, uh, was a fixture of all of the shows uh, of cybersecurity, such as the Black Hat Conference. And in this picture, he's on the stage at uh, Black Hat in, U in the US, at Black Hat Las Vegas, and uh, is on the stage making the ATMs that you can see there spit $100 bills. So he has exploited those ATMs from remote and making them spit bills on the floor. That's a stunt, right? That's, a, that's an attraction. There's people cheering in the audience looking at this. And the same goes for uh, Charlie and Chris, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, um, with their exploit on a Grand Cherokee Jeep. So uh, Charlie and Chris are um, experts in security, and they have dedicated their last few years of research to automotive cybersecurity, working also for different companies. And they're not academics. They're uh, hackers and industry experts. Um, so uh, the uh, Jeep hack was, uh, was uh, of enormous resonance because, you know, <laughs> what happened was this. Uh, Charlie and Chris put in that car Andy Greenberg, a very famous American uh, journalist covering cybersecurity, and they hijacked the car and drove Andy off the road from another state. That was the demonstration. That was a stunt hack, the, the definition of a stunt hack. And uh, in, in doing this, they instantly created attention to the problem of automotive cybersecurity more than anybody else had done before. The funny thing is that most of their findings were actually already in a scientific paper published in an IEEE conference, IEEE Security and Privacy in 2010, with the difference being that the colleagues from University of California at San Diego, uh, the team are from uh, uh, Professor Savage, did not drive any journalists off the road. 
And thus, the attention raised to the subject was confined to scientists. Whereas instead, the stunt hack raised the immediate attention in the public and raised attention in the industry. So, uh, and, and finally, this is uh, uh, my uh, friend, former student, uh, former colleague, uh, Dr. Federico Maggi, during one of the experiments in our research on the security and safety on industrial robots. And uh, these, uh, the, the video for, from this presentation uh, was then uh, published by newspapers, and it will be the subject that I will use later on to illustrate a point. So I will not dive into the, um, into the example right now. I will dive in there later. Uh, so we all want to see the attractions. And what are the attractions, really? The attractions are, um, are stunt hacks because our conferences in the sector reward not the academic conferences, but the hacker conferences and the industry conferences reward attack research. And the reason for that is that most of the people in offensive security and in uh, cyber physical system security are originally hackers at heart. We enjoy seeing good attacks and because these attacks are to hackers what uh, mathematical proof is to a mathematician and what a poem is to an artist. They are beauty, they are ingenuity, and they demonstrate a flaw in the most spectacular way. However, we are not confined to our academic conferences and to our IRC channels anymore. Our research ends up in the front page news of newspapers, and our findings impact the public perception of how secure or insecure systems are. Uh, let me give a few examples. And please uh, let me state beforehand that I am not going to criticize the research. I am going to actually use the research to outline a point related to the public impact and the public perception of it. OK? So example number one. What happened in the circus? Uh, Andre Kostin, a great colleague working at uh, Eurocom right now, if I recall correctly, in southern France, publishes a research called Ghosts in Air Traffic, showing a vulnerability of the ADSB protocol. The ADSB protocol is a protocol used in aviation to transmit location and direction data for aircraft. If you have ever used the Flight Radar 24 to track an aircraft, that's the protocol Air Flight Radar 24 is pulling its data from. Now, this protocol, a long story short, then if you want, you can go and fetch the um, presentation by Andre. But um, long story short, ADSB is not authenticated and, and does not provide any form of assurance for the company. So it is a vulnerable. But in reality, it is designed like this because of a reason, because operationally, it's uh, more useful to have it open and unsecured than it would be to have it secured and have to rely on some sort of central authority, which in the world of aviation could only be ICAO to provide like keys or whatever else. It would be a mess. It would be a major key management mess, probably slowing down adoption. And instead, what you want is ADSB transmitters to be on all aircraft as soon as possible. Additionally, the fact that um, humans are constantly in the loop and there's no automated system on aircraft that takes as input the data from ADSB as such makes it so that this research actually has a very, very low possibility of creating lacks of safety. It's still interesting. It's a good research from an academic point of view or from an Akish point of view. But 
impact very low extremely limited however on the media and i'm using uh, uh, um, uh, an example from andy greenberg that is a great journalist covering for security so not a journalist that had some you know background knowledge issue it's, it's a good one next generation air traffic control vulnerable to hackers spoofing plays out of thin air now <laughs> Hackers are good at many things, but spoofing a plane out of thin air is not, surely not one of those. This is how our research gets communicated, and it creates uh, an impact in the public. And if you think that this impact in the public is not relevant, think again, because I have another example. Still from aircraft security, uh, Ugo Teso, former a penetration tester in one of the leading U.S. companies, and then cybersecurity expert at Emirates. So not exactly the first person coming to this field, right? Um, created an attack before joining Emirates. So he bought a flight management system from eBay. A flight, the flight management system is the component on aircraft that is used to perform several navigational tasks. If you have ever entered the cockpit of a modern of a modern airliner, it's the console with a lot of buttons in the middle between the two uh, the two pilots. I don't have any better way to designate to you this um, this component. And uh, the use of the FMS is, for instance, entering the waypoints for the lateral movement of the plane. So for uh, the controlling the movement of the plane through at the autopilot. Now, um, you go uh, use the ADSB information disclosure to select a plane in, in his demonstration, and then showed how to exploit the flight management system and use the simulator to show how this would affect the plane. So it's a three part thing two demonstration things and one thing related to exploitation. The exploitation part was pretty good. But this, uh, you know, outside context, inside the context, it grew to be something that had to be debunked by the FAA because it, it was growing out of, uh, uh, out of bounds. Because, and this is Darlene Storm, another great journalist, uh, uh, titled Hacker Use an Android to remotely attack and hijack an airplane. There was no Android involved. It was actually just the demonstration of Flight Radar 24 that um, Hugo used the, at the beginning of the talk to, to show how you would pull the data for an airplane. And uh, for sure, it would not be able to remotely attack because in order to attack the FMS, you would need to reach it. And to reach it, you would need to go through satellite communication. So you would need to compromise a significant part of the world's infrastructure of aviation to do that. And I jack an airplane. That's absolutely not, not, not feasible because the FMS controls the lateral movement in the autopilot and uh, um, and uh, this uh, uh, means uh, that uh, um, you um, that you can by exploiting the FMS get the autopilot to give a wrong lateral input, but not hijack the plane because there's pilots on board the plane. So the impact of this vulnerability is completely different than what is represented here. And this made a round of the world. This is an Italian newspaper talking about the same and talking about this misperception that an app on a smartphone can hijack a plane. Now, what perception do we give to the public? What perception is, uh, do we give to the public? The perception that we give to the public is that um, is the same as from this comic, which is a very old comic. You can tell that because uh, the laptop has a Bluetooth stick, which no laptop has nowadays. But the screen is saying, Windows has detected a new peripheral, an Airbus A320. Do you want to run auto configuration? 
that's that's not possible but it's the impression that we have transmitted to the um that we have transmitted to the um to the audience to the global audience why does this keep happening over and over and over again with cyber physical systems particularly? Well, it does not happen only with cyber physical systems, to be fair. It happens also with other types of hacks. But with cyber physical systems, it happens more. And the issue is that, one, they are systems that people can touch. If you hack into the data center of a big bank and move gazillions of money, yes, that's an enormously impactful hack. But money doesn't scream. People on airplanes scream. So when people think of an attack against a bank or an attack against an airplane, the second one is actually going to draw their attention way more. And uh, this is true for common people. This is true for politicians. This is uh, Vivian Redding that was the vice president of the European Commission, not the current one, not the previous one, the one previous to that. So this has been back, going back for like 15 years. Um, talking about the potential of attacks for of cyber attacks, focusing on what cyber physical systems. Why? Because that is what is going to impact the public and the public perception. Rail the railroads not working, airplanes not flying, uh, and uh, uh, um, power not being delivered to our homes, healthcare being disrupted. That's that's what people can worry about. Um, because these systems have an impact on human life, they have a safety impact on human life. Let me give you a different example. Industrial robots. Now, these robots that you may have seen on any industrial production line, they are big, bulky, and they perform very fast movements. So they are placed in what is called a protected space. The cage you see is a protected space. If you open the cage, there is an electrical relay that actually cuts the power to the engines of the robots and enacts the braking immediately. Now, robots of this type can be acted into, maybe, but if a human is in the cage, the robot is stopped, no matter what the hacked into computer is telling it. The robot is stopped electrically. Now, we are moving towards a future where uh, robots are more like this. This is um, a robot from ADB, and it's called Yumi. And uh, um, Yumi is a collaborative robot. It is built to work alongside humans on a, uh, on a variety of tasks and not to harm humans in any way or shape. Um, this uh, is the um, this is the type of robotics that we are putting into companies right now. And do not mistake me, Yumi is super safe. If Yumi touches you, it stops. If Yumi interferes with your movement, it stops. There is no way that Yumi can generate a force enough to harm you. But all these safeguards are not physical safeguards. They are implemented by Yumi's super sophisticated software. So they can be broken into and they can be disabled. So we need to protect Yumi way more than we protected his older brothers and sisters. Systems such as Yumi, such as the robots, such as the aircraft, such as the cars, are becoming more and more reliant on automation. Think of autonomous vehicles. Now, we are probably, and we in the, you, you in the audience and uh, we here, are mostly engineers or computer scientists or technologists in general. And we know just how often computers fail. 
Now, I'll break you to a secret. Other people know that as well. People expect computers to fail. When you tell someone, oh, the computer is, is, is broken down and, and, and it needs to be rebooted, they do not even flinch. They're like, ah, yet another time, yes, regular. So before jumping in a car, in a vehicle, that has no steering wheel and no brakes and is driven by a computer, they will think about it twice. In order to get people to trust automation, we need them to overcome fear. Automation always evokes fear for humans. The pictures on the slide are from a film that for my generation of hackers has been very important. That's uh, War Games. It's a 1983 film. And uh, in it, there was the first time that a hacker was depicted as the main character of the picture. So it was a role model for many of us. Now, as much as we liked it for that, War Games is not about a hacker. Where Games is a movie about fear of automation, fear of what happens when the control of nuclear weapons is handed over to an artificial intelligence. That's what the movie is about, not about hacking. Hacking is a means to an end, but the movie is about fear of automation. Automation has always evoked fear. In films, in uh, uh, novels, in the... Um, in the culture of humans, automation is fearful. And so if we want people to trust cyber physical systems that are highly automated, that are safety critical, that put human lives in danger, that, uh, um, that move around our cities, that form in the future the bulk of our city's systems, we need to change pace we can keep the circus going because stand hacks uh, are super important to raise awareness, to evoke the scenarios that can happen and to point out where the problems lie. But they focus on specific vulnerabilities and specific instances of vulnerable systems in order to demonstrate where the vulnerabilities may lie. And this is not that relevant. Um, this is a quote from Dan Gear. Dan is, I think, the most important uh, visionary in the field of cybersecurity in the world. If you can, uh, uh, if you have one spare hour of your time and you want to, to to see an important presentation, go see his uh, keynote from Black at the USA 2014. You can find it on YouTube. And in this keynote, he says a lot of amazing, insightful things. But one thing is relevant to this talk. He says, he basically wonders, are vulnerabilities dense of, or sparse in software? Which is a, actually a software engineering question. Are bugs dense or sparse? Because if, if vulnerabilities are sparse, then by finding them one by one and correcting them, you are significantly impacting the risk of systems. But if vulnerabilities are dense, and we don't know which of the two things is true, but we have every reason to believe they are dense, killing one more is not going to change anything dramatically. So, we should totally kill down vulnerabilities when we find one, but that's not the way we get to secure systems. Not by killing the vulnerabilities one by one. In fact, the resources spent in killing those vulnerabilities are ill-spent if vulnerabilities are dense. If vulnerabilities are sparse, then we can go ahead and fix them one by one. But since we believe that they are dense, we probably are not going to solve anything by squashing one vulnerability at a time. I don't know if you have uh, uh, in your mind uh, the game uh, called Whack-A-Mole. Uh, it's a game that is commonly 
found in fear uh, in fears and uh, luna parks and you have like this emmer and there's the mole coming out of you know, of pools and you try to walk them and you can't you, you, you know actually you can't so this is a walk a mole game with vulnerabilities and we cannot win it but we have already seen this happen all of this has happened before and all of this is happening again quote for Battlestar Galactica enthusiasts. And how do we prevent it from happening again? By studying history. In history, for instance, in kernel exploitation, kernel, the Linux kernel is riddled with holes. We cannot fix them one by one, but what we can do is try to fix the exploitation ways, the, the exploitation um, routes and the routes of impact that an attacker can use to exploit those vulnerabilities. That's what uh, GRSEC and PAX team have been doing. That's what Brad Spangler, that is the, 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 the man behind GR security, has been doing for a lifetime. And guess what? That works. That works. So we cannot uh, go ahead and uh, uh, try to fix the vulnerabilities by squashing them. And in particular, we cannot squash them with public hacks. We need to restore the confidence that the public and our colleagues in the other areas of the profession have in the fact that we are able to actually deliver a system that is safe enough, which does not mean a system that is invulnerable, because that's impossible. We need to figure out ways to uh, filter out, uh, um, to, uh, to, to uh, uh, stop the routes of impact that, uh, that are in cyber physical systems. How do we fix this? Well, one of the big advantages in being an academic is that you get to raise the points without having to actually fix anything. But I have a couple of insights that I want to share uh, from research and, and experience that may lead us in the right direction. Um, first thing, we need to think systemically and not of the specific ones. I will uh, use an example, and this example is from my own research so that I can bash myself instead of others. Uh, this is a research that appeared in a IEEE uh, Security and Privacy Symposium, which is uh, the leading conference in, the, in, the acad in academia in the field, and it's uh, uh, our conference, and it has been organized for, I think, almost 40 years. I don't remember if 40 already. Um, so one of the oldest venues for discussing security. And uh, uh, it also appeared at Blackett, the top industrial conference. So. Um, I'm using the Black Hat talk as an example because that, as, as it was the case for Charlie and Chris, uh, uh, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, uh, this uh, is where the impact happened. We went to present this to the Black Hat crowd, and this is what the circus cheered for. We found that uh, uh, at boot, uh, the various components of the, ro of the uh, robot downloaded via FTP from a centralized FTP in the robot, uh, their software, without checking it, without code signing, without anything, you could substitute it, you could patch it, you could change it, you could put a ton of zeros and break the software and break the, the controllers themselves. So uh, that, that was a complete weakness in, in the architecture. Cheers from the audience. Um, auto configuration, you could put a, com a file in a specific uh, path and it would be automatically executed and, and give you full access to the robot. Um, the robot uh, even had um, default login and password that you couldn't change. So any ABB robot until a certain version of software had these default login and passwords that you couldn't change or remove. Um, and finally, uh, for those that are more technical among you, you will recognize um, some textbook buffer overflows here. Uh, they are literally the lines that you use in courses to show how a buffer overflow works. So literally textbook vulnerabilities. These are inside the software of a robot that weighs half a ton and costs several tens of thousands of euros. And uh, additionally, since they are on a very um, on a uh, on a uh, operating system that is aimed at industrial real-time control, uh, there's no 
uh, ASLR, no stack protection, you can overflow these and execute code from the stack as if it were the 90s. So this is what the circus cheer for. Then on the press, we got the following titles. Catastrophe warning, watch an industrial robot get hacked. Watch hackers, that's us, hackers, sabotage an industrial robot arm. All of this happened because we made a video, right? So the, the, the news outlets published the video. And hackers are remotely controlling industrial robots now, my favorite title ever. So these were actually good coverages of our research, but the resulting public perception was that people could hack into robots and create their own private Skynet. Oh my God, the sky's falling. But that's not what the research was about. The research was about exploring post-exploitation strategies. We explored how to exploit the robots, not because it was interesting, but because it was a demonstration. The interesting part was how do we avoid attackers from exploiting these, uh, uh, these vulnerabilities and actually um, create damage. And if you think of the specific types of attacks and that uh, uh, an attacker, uh, the specific type of goals, sorry, that an attacker may have, and you think of ways to close off those goals, there's intuitive ways that you can deny the attacker their goals. In order to do this, we, you need to explore the threat landscape, what the attackers uh, um, might want to do, uh, and um, figure out ways to minimize the impact that vulnerabilities may have on those uh, uh, on those threats. For instance, one of the threats, in our opinion, is that an attacker may want to uh, perform uh, uh, an attack with uh, some kind of ransomware and block uh, an, uh, a production line. Now, if you think that the robots may be attacked through ransomware, there's only a few ways to lock up a robot through ransomware. And you can, instead of focusing on fixing all the vulnerabilities that are way too many, you, I've shown you uh, the quality of the code uh, in uh, one of the critical parts of the robot. Uh, that quality of code means uh, that you uh, cannot really go and fix uh, the vulnerabilities one at a time, right? You can, um, you can, however, try to deny attackers their goals. And uh, you can uh, um, change the architecture to improve resilience. Um, for instance, well, I, I know that this will sound like obvious, Captain Obvious, but it's not there. For instance, the different components of the robots may check for uh, signatures on updates in order not to change software uh, with the software of the attacker's choosing. So if this were applied, even if the single components of the robot can still be attacked, the impact of the attacker on the, um, the impact of the attacker on the um, On, on, on achieving their goals is, is, is basically reduced. It's not like we can overlook vulnerabilities at that point, but we are reducing the impact that these vulnerabilities have. And since in cyber physical system, the aim of the attacker is not the cyber part, but it's the physical part. If we deny them the goal in the physical part, then the cyber part will just fall into place uh, will just become less important. We will still care about it, but not that much. Um, from there, we proposed a research uh, direction 
and then we explored it um, to analyze uh, the, um, for instance, the um, domain language used by used by uh, programmers and robots. Now, I don't know how much experience people in uh, in the call have on uh, um, the robotics domain. I, I sure didn't have one before starting looking into this. I mean, I had my university training from my background, but that was it. So the most robots are coded using uh, um, domain-specific languages. For instance, ABB as uh, Rapid, and uh, they are, you know, task-oriented languages that tend to have some interesting shortcomings. For instance, if you want to make two robots communicate over the network, one of the most used techniques by robotic programmers all over the world is to literally write the sockets and the and, and a, a doc protocol designed by them and transmit it by calling the sockets. Outside of basic programming classes, I don't know of any programmer that opens up sockets and uses them naked without any library on top implementing uh, uh, implementing protocols, unless they, their job is to implement protocols. But those are a specific class of programmers, right? These are automation engineers. They do not know that much about programming, and they do not know that much about security at all. And they are opening up sockets and sending data naked from one to the other. And this is just asking for vulnerabilities to appear. So um, this is the first suggestion. We need to do what we did with the robots. We need to think systemically, think of impact, think of resilient strategies, think of architectural changes, think of um, large attack surfaces that have not been identified yet and closing them off. That's the first part. Second part, we want to embed security in the design process and to make our security decision risk-driven. I will use automotive here as an example. So there was the um, Charlie and Chris attack, but there were all sorts of other attacks. But we also had some interesting attacks uh, on CAN uh, over time. But in reality, most of these attacks, and not maybe not all of them, but most of them, are the same attack. Cars are networks. They have between 70 and 150 computers on them, and they are all connected to a network that is trusted. And every message that passes on this network is just believed by any component of the network because, you know, traditionally, there was nothing else on that network. And in automotive security, the principle is, as, as, as astonishing as it may sound, the principle is that is, if you are inside the car, it's your car. If there is a connector inside the car, it's trusted. Because if you are inside, it's already yours. So this is not true anymore. ECUs on the cars may be connected to the internet, so they may be exploited from remote. And if they are exploitable from remote, then the attacker may find an exploit, exploit them from remote, and from there, since they are on a trusted network, they just send messages and everything else on the car will believe that. So you can do anything to a car once you have penetrated its uh, external layer of protection. And that's exactly what Charlie and Chris did. And it changes. You can do infinite attacks on a car. And these, uh, knowledge of these attacks will not shift. You, you can perform a thousand more, and you will not shift one inch the knowledge, because we already know about that. But you may do some interesting stunt attacks, of course. Now, there's also, so I'm, I'm focusing in this presentation on the offensive circus, but sometimes the defense circus is even better than the offense circus. So, what the FCA did in order to fix uh, Jeeps uh, was to mail to each Jeep owner a USB key with instructions to slam the USB key inside the uh, enter infotainment module of the vehicle and let it do its magic, let it update itself. 
which is an excellent training to all of their owners to actually slam any USB key that gets mailed to them in the vehicle and let it do their magic. It's a terrible idea, but it's the least worst idea that you could have because the other alternative was to send all of the, I think, 2 million owners of these vehicles to the dealers for a software update process that takes hours uh, and that the dealers did, totally did not want to do. If any of you has ever brought a modern vehicle to a dealer and tried to ask the dealer specifically, because if you don't ask them, they will never ever do it unless there is a specific mandate from the uh, OEM to do it. If you ask them to update the, your vehicle software to the latest version, they will flat out refuse because it will take hours and at the end, there's no assurance that it will still work. So if it's working, you don't touch it. But this does not really work for security, right? So what's the systemic way out of this mess? Well, the systemic way out is that we need to realize that the issue here is the fact that Ken is a trusted network. It's so trusted that um, anything that goes on it is believed. And there's a lot of, so the first instinct of any computer engineer watching this, because all of this has happened before and all of this is happening again, right? We look at it and we think, oh, oh no, this is like 90s networks. No, 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 you need to change the way, you need to change the protocol, you need to change the structure of the network. Once you are done doing saying this, all of the automotive engineers have already filed out of the room because that's absolutely not going to happen. It's impractical. And so you need to find another way to deal with it. Um, and another part of research tries to come up with the magic intrusion detection systems. I, I, I always love the magic intrusion detection system. I love them so much that my doctoral thesis in 2006 was on machine learning based intrusion detection systems. And you guess what? They didn't work in 2006, notwithstanding the fact that I got a PhD. They didn't work in 2016 and they are not working now. It's a lot of years of not working. And it's not like if you put them in vehicles, they will start magically working again because They've never worked, and they will never work. They will never work well enough to prevent a hack from happening. You really, really don't want a machine learning algorithm of any sort between you and the braking system of the car. If you hit the brake, the car should brake. Even if there is a machine learning algorithm that says, eh, no, well, this control does not seem like normal. Of course it's not normal. I'm going to slam into the car in front. It's not normal, but I want you to break now. So no, IDS is not going to do that. Uh, and in addition, we designed and showed attacks that simply cannot be detected by an IDS. So yeah, no dice. Uh, changing can with something else will only move the problem. Squashing the bugs in thousands of combinations of ECUs and their firmwares is absolutely pointless. We have already said that before, but if you think about it, the, just the, the, the sheer number of model years, vehicle models, number of ECUs, different, uh, different firmwares, it's a mess. It, it cannot be fixed by fixing all the vulnerabilities. So the only way we can approach this is through secure design of networks based on a risk approach. We need to perform the, medical, the minimal modifications and mitigations that are going to avoid the attacker getting their goal. So if you think of the goals of the attackers, and if you're thinking of a vehicle, there's only four things that an attacker may want to do. Uh, endanger the safe operations of the vehicle, steal the vehicle itself, get the private personal identifiable information on the vehicle, and get the intellectual property that is on the devices on board the vehicle. These are the four things that an attacker may want to do. If you stop them from doing these four things, you don't need to fix all of the 170 uh, ECUs on board the vehicle. It's not going to happen, but it's not going to be needed either. But you need to do this by focusing on the goals and fixing what needs to be fixed in a risk-driven uh, in a risk-driven method. So, in conclusion. Uh, when, it, when we deal with cyber physical systems and their security, we, um, in general, actually, in general, we focus way too much on attacks research. And if an attack offensive researcher such as myself tells you this, 
it means that we are onto something, right? If, if I told you, oh, do, the other guys are, are getting too much attention, but I'm telling you that I am getting too much attention. So maybe I'm sincere in that. Because vulnerabilities in the grand scheme of things do not really matter. They matter to raise awareness. They matter to demonstrate a possibility. But that's not. But fixing vulnerability is not the way you fix things. And so, beyond the awareness raising, when you have already raised awareness, stunt hacking just distracts the industry and the public from actual sensible risk-based security. Where we need to focus right now, focusing on structural resilience. What happens? in order to avoid the attacker getting through once they've gotten in the system. Architectural changes. How do we change the architecture of the system so that uh, the worst can be avoided? Impact reduction, avoiding the attackers getting through with their goals. And their goal usually is physical, not digital. So the digital part, eh, ditch it. We need to focus on denying the physical goal. If we do this, we are going to improve the state of uh, security in cyber physical systems, which at the moment is abysmal. So any improvement is actually very easy to do because it, there's so uh, there's so much, just so much to do. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I have uh, um, I'm done abusing of your time and uh, your attention. I thank you for uh, for it. Uh, you can reach me through the contacts that you see listed on the slide. And while you type any additional questions in the Q&A, let me state once again that none of the things that I said are related to other people's research, related to my research, who cares, but related to other people's research is to be meant as a criticism of the research. It's a criticism of the media impact. And this is very important. And I want to iterate that. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm open for questions now. Okay, uh, there's a few questions here. Um, uh, the first uh, public stunts approach uh, appears to be outdated by a few decades. The drive now seems to be more political or financial gain uh, involving nation states and organized crime. Um, and the majority of the public does not seem to be amused by these stunts, uh, but they do participate uh, voluntarily. Um, anything you'd like to comment on that? Well, so um, I, I would love the uh, stunt uh, hacking to be back to being fun again. And I totally agree that uh, we have uh, uh, way more pressing things that are in the news. So yes, uh, this, is, uh, surely, this is surely a shift. We still do have a lot of stunt hacking uh, happening at uh, research conferences and so on. And I think it's, and I, and I think it's useful sometimes for raising awareness of new topics. But then, yes, we need also to take uh, careful attention of what um, incidents show to us. And this in cyber physical system is super difficult. Because for instance, if I wanted to go and, and have uh, examples of industrial control system attacks in the real world, there's basically two that we all use as examples. Stuxnet and the accident incident, actually, because it was an attack in a steel mill in Germany in 2014. These two things are on the presentation of every single cyber physical systems expert in the world. Why? Because they are the two that ended up on the newspapers. But we don't have good ways to share information about those attacks that companies withstood and then um, survived. These are in the newspapers because you know, they were actually so damaging that they could not be contained. But um, in the case of other attacks, we don't have good ways to share information. And we would need it because that's the, you know, somebody did this to me version of a stunt hack to raise awareness. There's a uh, another comment on here um, that there actually is a computer that can override pilot control uh, on many air on on one major airplane, the Boeing 737 MAX. So um, I think that's an example of, of where, uh, what can go wrong if there's a computer between you and the brake pedal. So. I, am, I totally agree. I think the, 730, the 737 MAX uh, is an astonishingly bad example of what can go wrong in at all possible levels, managerial, uh, QA, 
uh, training, whatever. You, you name it, you get it. It's, it's, a, it's an astonishing fractal example of, uh, of, of things going wrong. Um, but the, um, and, and I agree that the fact that now that's not a safety threat does not really necessarily, in general, does not mean it's, not, it's never going to be a safety threat. But ADSB is designed not to be used for critical things. That, that's, the, that's the portion about it. Of course, this, this could be, uh, you know, people can get this wrong and, and people getting it wrong can happen at any time. But um, this also means that, for instance, ADSB can be not be used as a blueprint for another protocol that instead is going to be used for critical things. That, that's an important lesson. And this lesson was in uh, uh, Andre Costin's research. It's just the impact on the press that was completely uh, out of proportion. Um, another question here. What is your definition of a cyber physical system? Oh, um, it's a, um, that's a very good question because different people define that differently. But broadly speaking, the concept is any system where uh, a computer has sensors and or actuators and is operating on the physical uh, on the physical world. So even your basic IoT system in, in your house, like your connected thermostat is, is a cyber physical system in, in, a, in the grand definition of things. But usually when people talk about IoT, they tend to talk about the small things. And when they talk about cyber physical systems, they tend to talk about the big things that can do a lot of damage. That's, that tends to be the, 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 the distinction. But yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a good question because everyone has a different definition. Uh, what role does risk? Uh, what role does risk um, management play in your in any of your suggestions? Oh, risk management is the fundamental uh, part of security engineering. Uh, absolutely, and in yeah. fact, in my last uh, consideration, um, risk-driven design is is kind of the start of the design process. Um, the risk management is fundamental just because we can, as, as I said, we cannot eliminate vulnerabilities, right? We cannot reduce vulnerability to zero. We cannot make systems invulnerable. We cannot make systems secure. Uh, the definition of a secure system cannot be it, it, it lacks vulnerabilities. The definition of a secure system is it is secure enough to handle and manage the risk connected with whatever operational, uh, operational requirements uh, it is being used for. Um, let's see. Um, what do you think about the approach of uh, testing, 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 more testing, <laughs> just endless testing? That's the engineer's approach, and I t totally and wholeheartedly subscribe to it. They would pull my degree if I didn't. Uh, there is a um, there. There was a beautiful. Uh, uh, there was a, there was this beautiful article in Computer, I think, a decade ago. Uh, which was uh, whose title was "If you didn't test it, it doesn't work," um, and and I think that that should be mandatory reading if it's not yet for computer engineers. And there's a lot of things that we don't test, and so they don't work. Which is the reason why people actually come to expect that computers do not work. Which is super bad if we want them to jump into a car that is driven purely by computers. Um, the, the nature of the tasks that we have relying on cyber systems and a common public lack of understanding of how these systems work creates cyber and security paranoia, which is a leading factor um, that creates... Uh, let me see this question here. Uh, it creates vulnerabilities. Uh, there will always be vulnerabilities to exploit regardless of how much effort is put in patching that system. So how do you think a system would be deemed secure enough uh, and and how would cost play in the role in, in, in that decision? This is, a, this is a, at the same time, a very busy question and a question that we get wrong all the time. So it's a, it's a great question to ask. Uh, so there's some, uh, there's some um, supposed security experts that subscribe to the idea that paranoia is a virtue. I do not subscribe that, uh, to that idea. Paranoia is not a virtue. Paranoia is actually an illness that 
should be uh, properly handled. Paranoia is what happens when you lack the methodology to properly define the boundaries of trust that you are willing to accept. And uh, um, that proper boundary uh, is exactly the result of a risk management process that tries to balance the reduction in risk versus the cost. Where the cost is not just the economical cost, it's also the cost in terms of usability, it's the cost in terms of uh, uh, privacy impact, it's the cost in terms of all the things that security can do to make our life more miserable. So um, the, uh, the, the, the nature of the task is totally, as, as it was pointed out by the question, uh, to, to balance risk reduction and cost. Mm -hmm. But this is not, is, is not, is nowhere near enough uh, in the public perception. And uh, uh, the, the point is that for other things, uh, it's also not there. So I don't think we are going to be very successful in driving on this point, but it should be very clear, at least among us. And when we communicate our research results, uh, we should make an effort to make these uh, trade-offs very well understood. Okay. Um, yeah, going back to the, the the risk in cyber physical systems, who should be determined? Who should be responsible for determining the risk in those systems? Oh, um, this is uh, this is a difficult question. So uh, the problem with many cyber physical systems is that there is a large supply chain. So components are not done all by the and designed all by the same uh, company. In fact, in uh, in automotive, this is particularly evident. And so, what happens is that the OEMs, so the, the brands, the manufacturers, uh, um, try to push the security design towards the tier ones that are designing electronic components. I, I want a secure uh, head unit. I want a secure uh, ABS module. But this is impossible to push down because security is a systemic property. When you connect these things together, you are the one responsible for securing them. So uh, at the end of the day, in most, uh, for most uh, of these, uh, um, of these uh, composed uh, systems, uh, the final assembly, the uh, OEM, the manufacturer, the one that puts together all of the pieces, is the only one that can be responsible for the final sec the, sec the, the cybersecurity of the final product, and this is well understood. For instance, in aviation, where each single man each single uh, uh, vendor performs their tests and whatever, but at the end, the cybersecurity testing of Boeing and Airbus aircraft is performed by Boeing and Airbus through contractors, through their own employees in many many different ways, but it's performed. And it's been performed for a very long time before anyone in the public ever came up with the question, oh, is this aircraft secure? Uh, how would you approach the problem of physically tampering with a speed limit or other traffic sign to make a self-driving car misinterpret the sign? Uh, this, this actually happened a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, there's um there's been a number of uh, researches in this. There's um, a very active group uh, at uh, uh, the Ben Gurion University in Israel, for instance, that is doing research on this type of things. Um, you know, this is an interesting uh, and intriguing field because at the end of the day, if you are designing a system to be able to self-drive in the current uh, state of roads, you need to take into account that speed limits may not just be tampered with, but they may be wrong. I don't know about uh, the roads uh, in, in other countries, but in Italy, it's very common to find maybe an old uh, limitation of speed for you know, road works that has been left there because someone made a mistake. And if you are a human driver, you are going to see it and you're going to say, yeah, nah. This, this 30 kilometers per hour limit on the freeway is evidently a leftover from, from some works. It, you, you're going to ignore it. But the visual system of the car is not, I mean, the visual system in my car that is only helping me by reproducing the speed limits gets this wrong all the time. And if that were connected to actually changing the speed of vehicles, I would do quite a lot of emergency braking for no reason. So 
this is an important problem, but it's it it you know it goes beyond the problem of security. It enters the problem of how you properly design such systems and if such systems can be properly designed to drive on the roads of today. Um, moving forward from the roads and the vehicles, uh, uh, this is also a problem that a class of problems that is called adversarial machine learning that has an enormous amount of research interest at the moment. So if this is interesting to our viewer, I would recommend uh, typing uh, uh, adversarial machine learning into IEEE Explorer, and there's going to be more than enough to satisfy their curiosity for the next few months. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, are, is there any motivation to do systematic changes? Uh, how would you propose to overcome, it is too difficult to do, we need a faster solution right now approach to current engineering? <laughs> Yeah, that's a super difficult question. Um, one of the problems that I can see there, um, it's actually an economic problem. And the economic problem goes like this. As long as security and risk and the quality assurance of security is not a factor that the buyer can uh, detect, cybersecurity is a lemon market. Lemon market is a term used by economists uh, to define the market, for instance, of used cars that in the US are called lemons. So a lemon market is a market where the seller knows more or less how the device is going to work. Not even that, because the seller of a used car cannot really know in depth how it's going to go. But the buyer does not know anything of the kind. And if the buyer cannot know, if there is no information for the buyer, and in cybersecurity, we are right there, right? You, you, you look at two different industrial robots and you don't know which one is more secure. So if you don't have this information, you are, your most reasonable strategy is to go for the lowest cost. Because in any case, you don't know about the quality. So in the case of security, this is not, in the case of most cyber physical systems, security is not the only consideration. But security is not going to be factored in the price. And then there is no economic incentive for the seller to actually provide a secure product, at least beyond a certain basic capability. Uh, one, one more question, and this is, a, this is a good one. Have you ever made a discovery in which no one else believed? Huh. Or, or, or I guess, or come across a discovery which uh, you, you, you or no one else has ever believed. So sometimes uh, there are uh, limits to what you can uh, look at, and this makes it so that uh, some uh, research questions remain unanswered. So. Um, for instance, uh, if you are, I mean, if you want to experiment on aviation security, you are out of luck. You don't get an airplane to play with. And so when you say, oh, I think that this is broken, and uh, Boeing or Airbus says, nah, it's actually not. <laughs> the way this is used in the airplane, it, it, it doesn't work like that. You don't really get to, you know, to demonstrate your point. And so there are some areas in cybersecurity, and in particular in cyber physical systems, where we may be left with the doubts because you cannot really see. In general, being engineers has this huge advantage over being like, uh, uh, I don't know, philosophers, that you can put the thing to the test, right? <laughs> if you say that something is exploitable, you should be able to exploit it. But in some cases in cyber physical systems, you may not be able to prove that on the actual system because the system is too costly, too large, or you just don't have it. Well, I thank you uh, very much for your time. Thank you for uh, thank you to the audience for some some excellent questions. Um, our next session uh, will be in about two hours on uh, graduate programs in in cybersecurity and why it might be good to explore um, explore those. So, uh, you know, thank you again and uh, hope to see you on future sessions. Thank you very much. Thanks.